I remember back when I was younger, we would get high and lay on the grass and talk about how cool it would be to move to California and grow marijuana. California was the promised land of getting high on beaches drenched in sunshine. We had no idea how to make that reality happen, but we all knew that being a marijuana farmer in Humboldt County was pretty much the gold standard of life goals. Most of the cannabis in the Midwest was all moldy brickweed from Mexico. Every now and then, someone would come back from a trip to California, and we would all gather around to see the big, dense, and fragrant flowers that were called kind bud. Putting California flower next to Mexican brickweed, you'd not even know they were the same plant. And just like that, the kind bud was smoked, and it was gone, and after a while, it seemed like myth again that flowers like that even existed. But we knew they existed because we saw them in High Times Magazine. These ornate, colorful, and perfect flowers were pretty much unattainable to us. We considered flowers from California with reverence. The idea of California was more than just the gorgeous bud itself, though. It was the small, clandestine farmers in love with the land and making it work. It was these back-to-the-land folks giving up the city and growing their own food and subsisting on income from weed crops. You know, they may have been modest-income small farmers, but they were happy, and they were high, and they had community. The thing about that fantasy of California we held in our imagination was that it was actually pretty true. While the DEA certainly played a role and there was a general fear of outsiders, when I have talked to old-timers in Garberville or Mendocino or wherever, they describe a world quite like the one we always imagined it to be. Now, though, those farmers are being threatened by the potential consolidation of production into huge farms, leading to the end of the small family cannabis farm. But this is in no way a done deal, though. Small farmers in California can stand up and demand that their voice be heard and influence the implementation of Proposition 64 so their culture can be preserved instead of obliterated by corporatism. And it isn't only just on them. All of us, as cannabis enthusiasts, can speak up that we don't want only mass-produced flour. We want artisan flour, too, and we want to preserve California's cannabis heritage. Today's episode is part two of two in our series on the impacts and opportunities of Proposition 64 in California. If you missed last week's episode with Amanda Ryman of the Drug Policy Alliance, you can go back and hear our discussion about new business opportunities now that Proposition 64 has passed. Today's show is about what comes next for small cannabis farmers in California. My guest today is Hezekiah Allen, Executive Director of the California Growers Association. Hezekiah grew up off the grid in Humboldt County in exactly the kind of community my friends and I used to dream of living in. He lived off the land and cannabis was his agriculture. He realized that his community of farmers in the Emerald Triangle of Northern California could use someone dedicated to representing their interests, and so he progressed locally from executive director of the Emerald Growers Association to become the leader of the now more statewide-oriented California Growers Association. He now speaks for cannabis farmers and especially for small farmers with California policymakers. Today we're going to talk about the impact of Proposition 64 on small cannabis farmers and the actions necessary to preserve artisan cannabis agriculture in California. Welcome to the show, Hezekiah. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for making the time. So, you know, going into the election, there was a great deal of fear by a lot of folks about the outcome of Proposition 64. And and for some folks, especially people who think business-wise, simply not knowing how the election was going to turn out made business decisions really difficult. Now that we're on the far side of the election and we know that Proposition 64 has passed, what are you hearing from farmers and families in the Emerald Triangle region of Northern California? California, but how they feel now. You know, I, I, in a single word, I think uncertainty is is the overarching theme here. Um, certainly going into the election, there was a lot of uncertainty about how the legal adult use regulated market would play out. But I think coming out of the election, you know, and this is a bit of a curveball for, for everyone, coming out of the election, there's also significantly increased uncertainty at the federal level. And so, you know, exactly how this is going to play out and what implementation is going to look like was riddled with uncertainty to begin with. And now that conversation is is even a bit more uncertain. So folks, folks aren't quite sure what to think. 
um, you know, of course, my job and the reason I moved down here to, to Sacramento to work on this issue is to try to stay really at the cutting edge of that conversation to try to cut through some of that uncertainty. And, and right now, I, I don't have a huge amount of, of solid feedback to give to members. So we're, we're all sort of um, looking at what passed, looking at current law and speculating as to what may happen at the federal level. But certainly, you know, it's anything but celebratory. They're, they're, for folks who have criminal convictions or who are facing charges or are in jail, those folks are stoked and everybody is 100 percent in alignment that they should be out of jail and those charges should be dropped. But from the business side, a really, really tremendous amount of uncertainty. You know, that must be really frustrating for you as somebody who grew up in the Emerald Triangle area and as their you know representative down in Sacramento for them to turn to you for sage advice and insight, but for you to, you know, maybe not really know anything more than we knew before the election since the rulemaking hasn't really started yet. Um, as somebody who, you know, represents people who are not only your constituents, but like these are, this is your family and people you grew up and your loved ones. Um, there must be a certain amount of frustration kind of packed into that too. Yeah, you know, and, and this is certainly the frustration that we felt ahead of the election. You know, the the association, largest association of cannabis businesses in California with probably close to about 900 members at the time of this recording, you know, we, we felt that frustration ahead of time. There is a lot of policy in Prop 64. There is a lot of statute that was passed last year by the legislature and part of our concern and part of why we were never never able to get to a support position on Prop 64 is because of the immensity of it and because of how many aspects of it are a bit unclear and the disparities or disagreements with current law and trying to figure out which provisions will be preeminent, you know, which ones will actually govern the industry. And, and yeah, it is a bit frustrating. I mean, I guess the saving grace and, you know, bit of irony in, in describing it as a silver lining, but the silver lining is there's still plenty of things growers can be working on from water permits to labor law to tax law. You know, there's plenty of things that folks who are currently operating in the underground or gray medical market, there's plenty of things they can be working on. So there's not a shortage of compliance tasks for the growers to be doing. But it is certainly frustrating to have, frankly, more answers than we did the day before, or excuse me, more questions than we did the day before the answer, uh, before the election. Answers are hard to come by and questions are plentiful. Yeah, and, and you're probably trying to hand out more patience than anything to everybody. You know, I think it surprised a lot of folks that the voting returns from the Triangle counties actually came back in favor of the proposition. Now, even though I read over the weekend that Mendocino County very literally passed it by one vote, um, did it surprise you that the counties ended up voting in favor of it? No, I, you know, I think, I think at this point in 2016, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion from our perspective that it would pass. Um, we saw a lot of people that took a yes on adult use, no on Prop 64 position. I, you know, I would estimate, and some of our uh, initial post, uh, post-election surveys indicate that, you know, public support was probably closer to 65 or 70 percent. And the fact that we saw numbers in the mid 50s throughout the state, it reflects the fact that there there was a significant yes on adult use voting block, no on 64. Um, so I, I, we were pretty pretty confident that it was going to be successful this time. All of all of the numbers indicated such, and and there was no good reason to believe they weren't going to pull a majority. In, in most counties, the, the map looks a lot like we expected it to, frankly. You know, there, there's that schism that there was before the election, the, the, the yes on adult use, no on 64 folks. It was, it was hard because <clears throat> people who are family and friends and, and have done business together and medical providers, you know, it, there was this subtle cut in between the community and, um, the closer it got to the, the election and, and the more of it got turned up and up and up on social media, it was, it was pretty rough there right at the end. And I think that probably everybody is just happy to have the damn election over so we can deal with the reality of it instead of everybody, um, trying to convince each other and hate on each other about 
about whichever side they were on. Yeah, I certainly think that's an accurate observation. And, you know, I think one thing that was particularly acute for our community, you know, part of the cannabis culture in California is, is one of sort of escaping from the system, right? My parents went back to the land to get away from all of this. And so our culture is very much a, an outsider's culture. And for a lot of our members, this was the first election cycle that they've gone through and actually had a real tangible emotional stake in it. And so, you know, for for me and for folks who, who work in in politics, election fever is a pretty well known thing. You know, you get you get really, really worked up and intense and passionate in the weeks leading up to the election. And then you wake up the next day and you sort of see how long the hangover lasts. And so for a lot of people experiencing that phenomenon for the first time, it got particularly nasty, you know, boycotts of businesses that were voting no and just, uh, just uh, you know, frankly, a lot more divisive than it needed to be. And, you know, the beautiful thing is now that that cycle has concluded, farmers know about cycles. Now they understand, okay, so that was harvest, and now we're tilling the soil and starting over. And so to be able to have gone through the cycle, made it through the fever, and frankly, to have emerged more unified and stronger than we went into it, I think is a, a pretty significant accomplishment. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you there. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, too bad that it happened right there during harvest time as well. It must have been really distracting from everybody trying to trying to get the harvest in. Yeah, you know, I actually think we saw a bit of relief there um, right around the third week of October when the rains hit. We saw a lot of the social media, at least from my perspective, cool off. And, you know, everyone had more pressing concerns. The vote by mail ballots had already been mailed. And, you know, it was, it was back to the farm, which is where most growers want to be spending their time. So it actually worked out pretty well with the weather and the conditions and sort of gave us a bit of relief right in the lead up, the immediate lead up to the election there. Right on. Well, before we go to commercial, I want to ask you one cultural question about harvest over there in the, the Humboldt area. Um, you know, I, I heard once that there are so many growers in the area that um, the businesses that sell high price tag things like cars and stuff, they actually advertise um, harvest sales. So it's like you've made your harvest and then you've, you've sold it down the line and now you've got your big yearly income. Do, do you see that happening? Do businesses really really uh, target market harvesters because there's so many growers in the region? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the only thing that I'll correct um, in, in that sort of understanding of the situation is this is not a phenomenon that's limited to the Triangle, Tri-County region. I mean, this is something we see statewide from Calaveras, Tuolumne, out in the foothills, Nevada County, Sierra County, Santa Cruz. I mean, the, the one of one of the things from an academic perspective that I'm most excited about as this marketplace emerges into regulation is wrapping our minds and imaginations around the scope and the scale of our outdoor harvest. It is truly an epic agricultural feat that we managed to get all of this labor intensive, high value, delicate, by some standards, perishable product out of the ground, onto the wires, and into the turkey bags in such a short amount of time. So I am thoroughly excited about having better understanding of that. But yeah, you know, we definitely see that. In, in many ways, all of rural California is operating on a harvest cycle. And of course, you know, a lot of other agriculture has that same cycle. So it's not completely unheard of, but it's, it's really undeniable that, that the cannabis harvest is a major driving force in in regional economies up and down the state. Awesome. Thank you for that little bit of culture injection there, Hezekiah. We're going to take our first short break and be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. Using pesticides when growing cannabis has been common for a long time. Nowadays, though, we know better. We know that most pesticides formulated for food crops have never been tested for use with cannabis. They've been tested to be eaten in tiny doses. They have not been tested to be inhaled and especially not concentrated into a cannabis oil. Chemical residues from pesticides are not healthy for anyone, but they are especially dangerous for patients. For commercial cannabis growers, this has become very impactful. 
Cannabis enthusiasts and patients have gotten educated enough that they avoid growers who used pesticides. Not only that, but states across the country have begun making pesticide testing mandatory on all licensed cannabis crops. The time has come to find a better way to fight garden pests than covering your cannabis in chemicals. And there is a better way. Let some good bugs fight your bad bugs. Beneficial insects and predatory mites have come a long way since we were buying ladybugs online and putting them in the grow room and just hoping for the best. Natural Enemies Biocontrol can help you solve pest issues without using chemicals. Natural Enemies founder Shane Young learned best practices from working in the ornamental plant industry and has fine-tuned those strategies specifically for large cannabis crops. Shane works with commercial cannabis clients across the country to ensure that they keep their crops safe and pest-free without the use of chemicals. Natural Enemies has proven solutions for spider mites, aphids, thrips, russet mites, broad mites, shore flies, whitefly, and others too. You can rely on Natural Enemies for expertise and excellent service. For more information, go to shapingfire.com forward slash natural enemies or simply click on their banner in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is Hezekiah Allen, Executive Director of the California Growers Association. So Hezekiah, before the break, we were talking about the lack of certainty on growers' parts about what's going to happen next. And, you know, there are a lot of lobbyist groups who will be trying to influence policymaking in Sacramento. Do you think the artisan farmers throughout California, the smaller folks, will, you know, have a voice in the rulemaking? Certainly, if I have anything to do about it, they will. Um, you know, that, that is very much the purpose for which the California Growers Association was organized. Our, our general highest level metric of success will be how many independent grows are successful in the regulated marketplace. You know, oftentimes economists will boil things down to how big is a market? What is the gross productivity of this marketplace? But from our perspective, we want to go a layer deeper and we care greatly about what that ownership pattern looks like. And so transitioning, not just from what is the gross value, gross productivity of the market, but how many people, how many businesses are enjoying the benefits of that productivity. And, you know, that's, that's a, I think a very, relevant and salient message in in sort of the greater political, be it national or global, as we're looking at this economic reality that, you know, there's more wealth in the world today than there ever has been in the world. And yet absolute and relative poverty are off the charts. Not only are we offering this new and amazing alternative medicine, we're also bringing this very different culture that incubated outside of that economic development, you know, the post-war years, 1950 was not that long ago, and we had a very different wealth distribution, both nationally and globally then. And so our industry grew up outside of the consolidation. And to be able to bring that back in such a culturally stimulating, exciting, this is a product that people care about, it's in the headlines, to be able to bring that to the conversation in, you know, early on in the 21st century, I think has implications not just for our marketplace, but for the broader academic study of economics in general. And, you know, certainly at this point, we're pushing a thousand members. We'd love to double that again this calendar year. You know, we look around the state, we're estimating about 50,000 growers total, probably about 30,000 of them would eventually seek a license. And we'd love to see five or 10,000 of them licensed in year one. And so we certainly, I think it's fair to say that the existing growers in the state not only have a voice, but are one of the preeminent voices in Sacramento. And we're going to continue growing our membership and, and growing our influence accordingly. 
That is such both an honorable and a really difficult fight because, you know, capitalism just generally moves towards consolidation um, so that um, economies of scale can be taken advantage of and prices generally come down and profits are made. Um, but of course, what you're suggesting is that, um, you know, it's, it's better to have more small businesses than fewer gargantuan businesses. And, you know, that's where a lot of people's heart is. But pushing back on those economic forces is a real challenge. Yeah, I, it is. And, you know, where I grew up, uh, very few things were easy. Um, <laughs> you know, every harvest came at in spite of, at the time, a paramilitary war on drugs. You know, Bush Sr. sent the National Guard out a couple times. So, we, you know, we, we grew up on the front lines of this thing, and our culture was really tempered by that most extreme manifestation of prohibition. And, and you know, this is, this is the place that our culture is coming from. And, and you know, it's, it's certainly present in other states, uh, Washington, Colorado, Alaska, Oregon. You know, you, you had these experiences, but the center of gravity and the the there are so many people and, and businesses and farms coming from that place here that, you know, frankly, it's about time that we start questioning some of those basic tenets of economics and what better community of businesses to do it than ours. I mean, change has to be financed at the end of the day. You know, there's no way that we can win a revolution of economics, of sustainability, of labor, of any of these things that our culture is marked by, there's no way we can win that fight without a financial commercial base. And we're in a very unique position of, of, of having that. And that's why it's so important to permit and license those businesses so that this message that we carry continues to have voice and continues to have momentum. And, and I do think at the end of the day, if we stop and take the time to ask ourselves is this economic system working for us as people, as families, as neighborhoods? The answer, frankly, is no. And we do need to start doing some things differently. Um, we can look to a handful of states in the farm belt. Just to, to add a quick aside to it, there, there's about 11 states in the nation that currently restrict the corporate ownership of agriculture. And those 11 states from a human development index standard, they have some of the longest lifespans, lowest infant mortality. Everything is, is so much better than the states around them that have allowed for the financial sector to gut agriculture. There's something really, really special, a special kind of value that small farms bring to our communities. And building on that value, not just from a cultural perspective, but also from an economic perspective, it, it really needs to be the foundation of our 21st century. And, you know, the last point I'll make on this subject, it, it's, it's very uncommon for me to cite a World Trade Organization paper. <laughs> but in 2013, the World Trade Organization teamed up with the United Nations Commission on Trade and Development. And they released a report called Wake Up Before It's Too Late. Small farms are the only way to feed the world. And it really called into question the entire driving thesis behind the industrial agricultural revolution. And so at this point, there really is a global movement picking up steam to put agricultural productivity back in the hands of family farms. One of the biggest challenges, of course, to that, and one of the reasons the Obama administration didn't take this one on is because of the entrenched interests of agribusiness. These are, these are giants of global commerce, but they don't exist in our marketplace. And so we have this very unique opportunity to move quickly with a different type of regulations. And you know that's precisely what we've been doing and, and what we intend to continue doing. 
as executive director of the California Growers Association, you know, you have got, I think, at least two really nice advantages as far as, as getting your base involved. Number one, like you said, it's a, it's an industry that grew up outside of the consolidation world and in the gray area. And so you all have, you know, you've been to war together already. You've, you've had the war on drugs come to your neighborhood and it, and it bonded people and it really let people get to know know each other. Um, and so you're not a hodgepodge of folks that are put together. You're already um, a prepared, communicative folks who, you know, have each other's phone numbers and email addresses, right? But also as far as, you know, income distribution, which is what you've been talking about, you know, having the big uh, conversation and message of of Bernie Sanders in the election got people thinking about whether or not consolidation and big business um Help them as individual people, and I think that having having both your uh, people already know each other, and the fact that that message was pushed so heavily during this particular election can only help the California Growers Association. Yeah, and you know, frankly, we, we saw it from I think the Trump campaign as well. While a lot of folks on the coast, particularly our, our beautiful Pacific Northwest out here, I think we were triggered by some of the more racist, misogynist, xenophobic things that the incoming president said. But for academics who have now had the opportunity to take the time to go through speeches and to do quantitative analyses, whether or not it's lip service, the incoming president spent a lot of time talking about the damage that free trade agreements, the damage that this particular neoliberal breed of economic development has done to the heartland. And so while it's easier to find the affinity with the with the Senator Sanders campaign, I think that there's also a commonality in, in folks who, who voted for the incoming administration. And while, of course, we talked about the uncertainty at the beginning, we have no idea how this administration, particularly the incoming attorney general, is going to respond and react to cannabis laws throughout the country. There is an underlying majority, and I think a growing majority, that big is not better. And, and that's the fundamental question that we need to ask ourselves. I mean, we went through it in 2006, 7, 8 with the too big to fail era. And, and the way to not end up in that situation again is to prevent that level of consolidation. So I actually think that it's a it's a populist, it's a resurgent populist message that is bridging partisan divides, it's unifying campaigns. And frankly, I think that the Clinton campaign was unsuccessful because they didn't have a meaningful answer to this question. And I really think that over the next 10 to 20 years, this will be the defining question. How is this policy going to impact the middle class? Is this going to create more small business owners? And, you know, we need to get into some of those definitions. What is a small business? I'm sorry, grossing 2.5 million is not small from my perspective. You know, and, and this is one of those important areas where current state law for the medical regs defines small business very differently than Prop 64 does. Prop 64 defines a micro business as being four times larger than what current law defines the micro business as. So there's a real slant and bias toward larger businesses in Prop 64. And that ultimately was why we weren't able to support it is because it prefers fewer, bigger businesses over more smaller businesses. Thanks for that, Hezekiah. We're going to take another short break and be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. Businesses everywhere are constantly striving to reach out to people through advertising. We all know, though, that trying to reach a cannabis audience with a quality message is pretty difficult. That's why many people choose to advertise on the Shaping Fire podcast. Advertising on this show allows us time to talk about your product, service, or brand in a way that really lets people know what sets your company apart from others. Bold people who own companies know that getting into a relationship with their customers is essential. That is what we offer. 
We will explain your service or product and what sets it apart as desirable and help our audience get in contact with you. It's pretty simple, really. Advertising does not have to be all whiz-bang, smoke, and mirrors. Nowadays, I find that people prefer just to be spoken to calmly, accurately, and with good intentions. If you want to make your own commercial spot, you can do that too. Because the podcast is young, but growing at an exceptionally fast rate, if you become an advertiser on the Shaping Fire podcast now, you are going to pay a fraction of the cost we'll be asking for in just a few months. And yet everyone listening both now and to the back catalog of interviews later will hear about your company again and again for years. It's a great deal for you. Pay a small amount now because the show is new, but take advantage of the huge listening audience we will have forever. Do yourself a solid and contact us today for rates on podcast and newsletter advertising. Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out more. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I am your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is Hezekiah Allen, Executive Director of the California Growers Association. So Hezekiah, on the last episode of Shaping Fire, Amanda Ryman of the Drug Policy Alliance was on the show, and she said that the new law very much protects medical in California, but she also said that the bigger medical players who can afford the costs of compliance in adult use with the new law will very likely migrate to the commercial market. Now, you know, I've been a business strategist my whole life, and to me, that suggests to me a future where the medical market slowly gets drained of its major players and therefore major funding and it gets smaller and weaker until the commercial lobbyists who you know are dying to inhale that medical market find a way to say, oh, the medical market is irrelevant and they try to shut them out. How do you see it playing out at this point? Well, you know, I think that this idea that Prop 64 protects the medical marketplace is a bit more of campaign rhetoric than actual policy work. And so California was obviously the first to pass a medical law back in 96. We have a two decade long tradition of medical cannabis. It is compassionate use and compassionate commerce are very much the foundation of our cannabis industry and marketplace, be it regulated medical, unregulated adult use, or out-of-state sales, which, of course, you know, California is a, a large exporter of cannabis as well. But that culture really threads the needle between all of those marketplaces. And so the, the initiative would not have been politically viable if it was perceived to undermine that marketplace. So the campaign ran very, very heavily on this point that, you know, medical is protected, this is separate. That's not true, just to put it simply. Um, every Everything around town uh, in Sacramento here in the legislature, the regulatory agencies, everyone's pulling their hair out trying to figure out how we're going to fold these marketplaces together, what rules and regs apply to both. I think that before we knew the outcome of the presidential election, there was a pretty firm consensus that California would emerge with a single regulated marketplace now, I think everyone is sort of on alert that the federal government may decide to impose a distinction on the states, something to the effect of we'll respect states' medical programs, but we won't respect states' adult use programs. And so that uncertainty has certain, certainly clouded the conversation. But the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, at least up until the consumer uh, purchases the cannabis, there is likely to be one unified supply chain. A grower is not going to be a medical grower or an adult use grower. They're simply going to grow cannabis. Pesticide regulations are not going to differ. If it's not safe for a patient, it's not safe for an adult consumer. You know, those types of things are, are going to be unified. And that was always the intent. And so this is this is one of those places where policy and politics don't always match. And, you know, it, it was a necessary political goal to, to insulate and to carve out medical, but from an implementation, bureaucratic, who's going to give you a license? It's going to be the same office. There's not going to be two offices and two bureaus and two directors. So I think it, it's important to distinguish 
how politics and policy differ in this regard. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I've got a couple more questions about economies of scale here and how you see it playing out. So, you know, the economies of scale will continue to favor the large commercial growers um, as they start to create more profits because they can, you know, essentially buy things like supplies and labor in bulk. So do you think that the Emerald Triangle Appalachian region that will eventually be created will be enough to support the higher prices that artisan farmers were, will likely have to charge since they're smaller and can't take advantage of buying things in such mega bulk? Well, and so this goes back to that, that initial question, is bigger actually better? You know, there's been a lot of work done on the high cost of low prices and understanding that those economies of scale are not actually reduced cost. They just externalize more of their cost and society ends up bearing those costs, whether it, you know, for traditional agriculture that comes in the form of farm subsidies or for the oil industry, it comes in the form of unmitigated or unrestored environmental damages. But those costs still exist. In fact, if you want to get really technical about it, products grown, agriculture in particular, large scale grows are probably more expensive. The consumer is seeing a reduced cost, but the overall social cost is not reduced. And so we need to do a better job of doing true cost accounting. But, you know, that's all well and good academic, conceptual, feel good stuff. Let's talk about nuts and bolts on the ground. This is one of the biggest distinctions between Prop 64 and the medical regs. The medical regs limit any single license holder to one acre per lot and four acres cumulative. Prop 64 blows it wide open and allows a licensee to grow as much as they want. Frankly, we don't think anyone needs to grow more than an acre. And it's very much our intent this year in 2017 to ask everyone in the state who needs to grow more than an acre, raise your hand, come to the legislature and tell us why. Tell us what the public benefit of you doing that is. You're going to ask the state for some level of limited liability through a corporate charter. That's not a free pass. Corporate charters shouldn't be handed out so easily. Demonstrate how you will promote good jobs, not minimum wage jobs, good jobs. Demonstrate how you will protect California's scarce water and why going big is going to allow you to improve those metrics. And at the end of the day, the truth is they won't. These small farms are more resource efficient. They create better jobs. And so it, it really is a question of how we look at efficiency. Are those cost savings real or are they just externalized? And secondly, what are the secondary benefits and the multiplier effects of inhibiting those large grows? And I'll just say at the end of at the end of this conversation, there is a clear consensus that the lieutenant governor's Blue Ribbon Commission report states very succinctly, it is appropriate and wise for the state of California to limit the size and power, both economic and political, of any single entity in the cannabis marketplace. I think that if you had to make that argument anywhere in the country, you are the best place to make that argument where the ideas of, of social, socially conscious business and, you know, and triple bottom line profit, um, really, you know, people are, are interested to know that, okay, the, so the, so the company's making money, the share, shareholders are making money, but what impact is it having on the community? And, and let's not forget, um, that, it, that there's humans in all of these companies. So, so I think that if you, you know, if you had to make that argument anywhere, I'm glad that you're making it in California. You know, and strangely, we find ourselves drawing on some very unexpected bodies of policy. North Dakota, for example, has what I think is probably the most robust restrictions on corporate ownerships of agriculture. Um, you know, there's several states through the farm belt there that Right around the, the turn of the last century when, you know, the, the railroad barons were and, and disrupted and, and the, that last major wave of antitrust regulations went into place, um, you know, you see, 
you see some similar provisions in states that you really wouldn't expect this from. So, so there actually there there are some some other states out there that we're drawing from. But I certainly agree that you know if if we're going to if California is going to lead like we so oftentimes project that we do, which quick tangent, I'm not convinced that California is exactly the trendsetter nationally anymore. Um, but, but we certainly identify as such. And if we're going to lead in terms of those values, we're going to need to be bold and courageous. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to do just that. Right on. Well said. So um, for this last question, you know, I really try to do my best to decrease fear whenever possible, decrease fear and suffering in people whenever I have the opportunity. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are still afraid of Proposition 64 because it's passed and they don't know what the rulemaking is going to be. And as you have already mentioned, you know, a lot, a lot of more weird ass ingredients are going to be going into the sausage before the rulemaking comes out on the other side. So, so take a moment. What advice would you give fearful artisan growers who've been doing this for generations who are afraid of what comes next? What balm can you offer them um, that might help them get through just living through the rulemaking process? You know, we, we really focus on basic core values at Cal Growers and we try to boil things down to the most simplest of terms. And, and the two things that I can offer are really the outcomes are going to be better if we have a hand in shaping them. And the more organized we are and the more we work together, the more influence we'll have. So, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to veil the fact that this is a, a, a bit self-serving in that, of course, I want the organization to have more members but the reason the organization needs more members is not so that, you know, I can go on a fancy vacation. It's so that we can have more influence. We, we really are focusing our resources, pooling resources together to ensure the outcomes are as best as possible. And secondly, courage. What I can say with certainty is that the, the clock is not going to go backwards on this one. We are moving forward into a regulated future. And we need to have the courage to embrace that. The sooner folks get on the train, the easier it's going to be. Five years from now, it's going to be really hard to make the transition from unregulated to regulated. So be on, have the courage to be on the first wave, have the courage to, to jump in and go for it. Know that there are hundreds, if not thousands of other like-minded businesses throughout the state that are going through this together with you. And really at the end of the day, we're going to have the courage to work together to put our values first. And like you mentioned a minute ago, we value our profitability but we also value the places we do business and we value the people we do business with. And I, I, all I can say is that if we put our values first, we work together to advance them with courage, the world is going to be a better place than if we didn't. And I, you know, I, I wake up every morning and I give thanks for the challenge and the opportunity. And let's be intentional. Let's bring this amazing healing culture wisdom that is cannabis Let's bring it to the regulated marketplace and let's heal not just people and patients and consumers. Let's also heal the economics and the politics. So that's what I got. It's not going to get any easier. Let's do this together. Let's have the courage to do it and let's put our values first. Well, that's a great call to action. Thank you for that. And this has just been a great interview. Thanks uh, for taking the time to be on the show. I know that you're probably even more busy now that Prop 64 has passed than you were before the election. So thanks so much for taking the time and being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Hezekiah Allen is executive director of the California Growers Association. You can find their website at calgrowersassociation.org. And you can find out more about Hezekiah Allen at his website, hezekiahallen.com. And that's H-E-Z-E-K-I-A-H-A-L-L-E-N.com.
You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los.